All right, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. My name is Myron Curtis, and I'm the Deputy Section Navigator for the Far North Regional Consortium. That is seven Far North uh, community colleges uh, north of Utah City. This includes Glasson, uh, Feather River, New College, Mendocino, uh, Redwoods, College of Shasta College, and I think that's all set. <laughs> Uh, when you conjure up a picture in your mind of rural California, um, most people tend to think of farmlands, and we certainly have that up in far north. Many people probably conjure up uh, visions of the Dust Bowl, which kind of actually has some appropriateness. But for the most part, the far north is a very mountainous area full of rushing rivers, beautiful scenery, mountain and Florida. Um, and not a whole lot of people. Up until the 70s, the primary uh, industry was pretty much logging and agriculture and ranching, which is kind of agriculture. And a lot of those industries have started to fade. Actually, the logging industry um, started fading way back in the 70s, where they started shutting down mills. And of course, we had a whole uh, oil embargo thing that raised gas prices to the, the ceiling, which meant the poor people driving the, the logging trucks to no longer make money in one day hauling three loads of timber. And that was probably one of the main things that uh, killed a lot of the industry up there. We also, like I said, we have some beautiful colleges up there. I got the pleasure of visiting every single one of them. Uh, the students are incredible. The faculty are truly engaged. Um, they are all very interested in trying to make their community better. We do have some challenges. A lot of our challenges are very, very similar to uh, the challenges that a lot of uh, um, uh, what's a good way to put it? Ghettos have, to be honest with you. Um, state of California, we have 46,000 companies in ICT. Uh, it's the sixth of uh, the industries by total number of revenues. The, uh, this is probably old. We employ about a million workers. And uh, we're 12 by the number of total employees that our sector uh, employs and generating about $76 billion in wages. Think of that as about $15 billion in taxes. Right? Okay. Um, that's for the state. Northern California, most of our counties up there are running unemployment rates of around 10 to 15 percent. Let that sink in for a moment. What that means is Basically, two things. First of all, our counties don't have a lot of money. Our students don't have a lot of money. Our colleges don't have a lot of money. Anybody from any college knows that that's a concern. Uh, it's even worse for the high schools and the grade schools. Um, as we pointed out in the last session, ICT employment exists in every single industry. We own everybody, they just don't know it or haven't even admitted it yet. <laughs> but uh, you just about can't do anything without having some component of uh, digital information there. The growth is strong. Uh, we're going to have uh, some very severe shortages of laborers who are qualified for these jobs if we don't start getting them trained up and moved into those career paths. And as I had to look and point out in my faculty convention, the simple truth is that the students we now have, if every one of them went through and got a job, we'd still be short. So we need to get women. We need to get you know, uh, other underrepresented populations in there, Hispanics and the rest. We need to bring them together so we can keep those jobs in the United States. Otherwise, they will go away. Uh, there was a convention recently, I think it was actually here in San Francisco, where there was a representative from Google, a representative from Microsoft, 
and I think one from Oracle, and they basically told the participants, we have jobs, you get us the students, but we're gone. And they said, basically have about three years. So it's not only just, you know, a lack of labor, it's, it's a real urgency that we have to step up and meet. Our community colleges have about 3 million students. Um, we're promoted, at least, as being the most cost-effective way of delivering uh, the needed ICT education. We offer more than 600 associate degrees, uh, 1,500 academic certificates, and 295 departments That's across 112 community colleges. Actually, you could probably make this 111 because my last employee uh, completely disbanded the computer science department. They do have a little bit of ICT in their business department. A lot of these students actually transfer at some point in time to a four-year university. What we're finding, especially in the far north, the students will take as much education as they can to get a job. They go to work, they pay the bills, raise the kids, and then they come back to school to try to continue on. Not all of them make it back. So the problem. Over the past decade, I guess, we've lost about 5% of our uh, ICT faculty. Part of that was, a lot of that was budget cuts. You know, um, if you had one person teaching most of your ICT, but you don't have 5% of one person, so you pretty much lose your department. That's kind of what's happening over in Mendocino right now. They lost their one full-time person. Getting adjunct faculty is very difficult, especially if only have you know, two or three classes for them to teach. Especially when you're paying them $32 an hour. Right. I was actually making 65 but I've been there for But the problem is, have you tried to get an adjunct faculty member lately in ICT? <laughs> Anywhere? Yeah. Yeah. They get more money going to industry. In fact, industry is actually coaching a lot of our instructors right now. So it gives us kind of across the board kind of a catch-22. Yeah, give us the students. Okay, can we have somebody back to training? Right? Um, and it doesn't work very well. We can actually find ourselves, especially in the North, uh, trying to find a way to subscribe to instructors from somewhere else and have them video conference into a classroom or something. Maybe using CC and Perth. But anything that will keep that class alive so the students can get their necessary education and go fill one of these jobs. A lot of which don't really require them to move away if they have the resources available to be able to work on money. So we rely very heavily on part-timers in the far north. I think pretty much all colleges really do. It's just more cost-effective for the colleges. But you lose one or two of these guys, or ladies. They actually seem to be more ladies than I see teams working as instructors at colleges than there seem to be in industry. This is kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, you could easily lose you know, a complete department. So the budget cuts have been really, really difficult for us. The high schools, the grade schools, K-12, their programs related to ICT have been absolutely slashed and burned. And when you do that to a program, even if money comes in to put it back in there, it's probably going to take at least 10 years to rebuild it. Um, a lot of them don't have computers, which is okay because they don't have anything to sell anyway. <laughs> and uh, that's dedicated for the administration use. I talked to a couple of schools about, you know, getting donations. And they said, that would be wonderful. Except we can't do it. Because we don't have anybody to maintain. 
Uh, it would cost us more to get the software on there that we need than it would cost us to go get a grant and have all the software for us to live one set up. Great. Let's go get a grant. Uh, no. <laughs> no. The grants aren't there or they don't have a grant writer or, you know, there's one excuse after another. And like I said, some of them, I call, call it dial up. It's really DSL, but, you know, that's the same thing to me. So, one of the things we need, we could use some broadband up there. Now, if you look at the DUC maps, Public Utilities Commission maps, which are changing, by the way, uh, they show a lot more coverage than actually exists because when they first requested those maps to be built by the legislature, uh, they thought, okay, well, whatever's advertised would give us a good idea, but it turns out that that was a little inaccurate, so they're rebuilding those coverage maps. But probably in California and statewide, there's at least 1.6 million people who don't have access to affordable broadband. There are a lot of ways to get around that, um, especially in the more urban communities. There are nonprofits out there that will get computers and will actually help uh, purchase broadband connections for, for residents. It's a little more difficult up in the North State where you, you might be lucky to have a home telephone line up there. So even dial up up there a lot of times is, you know, 12 to 20 kilobytes a second. Ever try to download a picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is an anecdote to that. When I first got internet, the first time that I had email, my wife bought me the swimsuit edition of, uh, you know, uh, what is it, uh, Sports Illustrated. <laughs> so I took, and I, I had a scanner, so I scanned this picture, and I said, it's my brother. It took four days to transmit it. It took another four days for him to download it. And then when he had to look at it, all he could see was a little section up here. He had to move it over here like this. Yeah. He told me he enjoyed it, but <laughs> today, if you were trying to teach even a class online with that kind of connection, you know, by the time you get through the first learning module, the semesters that you go. So how do we deal with it all? I mean, uh, and, and then you have the, the administration, which is a big part of the problem in many of the colleges. You know, the deans and, and such who are, are uh, you know, still in the 90s, you know, mentality-wise. Well, you know, there, there is, it's actually kind of a practical situation. Mm -hmm. You know, there is only so much money in the meeting talk. Right. And you have several entities trying to feed from that same trough. You know, somebody has to parcel it out. And as they see people asking for bigger and bigger trucks, the probability that they can say no increases. Yes, you. So, I mean, money's a problem, and access is a problem. Right. I mean, there are workarounds if you don't have good access to mm -hmm. broadband. I mean, you can do basically a server, you know, providing linkage to all the computers in the classrooms and we just have some instructional materials around them, you know, the simulations and things like that. Um, but that takes money. Right. So I'm sure we really don't have either. Uh, not as much as we should either. The nice thing is the colleges themselves actually have broadband, but the, the system we're building when we uh, are building wide curriculum and we're trying to get more of our courses online for students so that they can get a course here, get a course over at this college over here and get through school faster, you know. Uh, it's very difficult if you can't actually take the course online because you don't have a connection yet. Now, this online, we talked about this last night, those yeah. online courses have to be real time or they can be stored forward or DVD? They can be stored forward, they can be DVD. Most of the campuses that I've talked to so far, when you tell them online, that's a web-based system. They're actively trying to move away from the, the old version of distance ed. In fact, ecologists shut theirs completely down pretty much where 
students can watch a TV program and have a, a, you know, a VCR or a DVD run that and do everything through the mail. That's kind of going away because it's more expensive and requires more equipment. Not right. right. just putting it up on the black or removal or something like that. So that, that, we may have to kind of come back to that for far long. Do kind of a the ICT Institute model, you know, uh, where they can uh, get their education through the mail or something like that. Because the biggest problem for us is we can't really solve this problem until there's money for the people in the community to want to invest in the new technology. So, what is LMI data coming about? The labor market information. Yeah. Um, most of the jobs up there in IT are the hybrid sector. That's what I thought. In small, medium businesses. Uh, health, which is a big industry. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that may be one of the key components I can use to kind of reverse the situation. Is because a lot of the medical institutions up there cannot build Medicare or Medi-Cal unless they're able to do that through what they call electric health reporting. <coughs> And there are some nonprofits out there that will help. Uh, they will actually help fund to have, say, an ISP run what we call dark fiber yeah. to those particular locations and allow some use of that to move out to education. I have high schools up there, like I said, that are on VSL, especially on the, uh, the coastal area. So that's one thing I'm looking at to try to get this fixed. Because uh, it's, it's let me take another step forward here. It's more than just getting them the broadband. It's more than just a, you know, a connection issue. These people have uh, been falling further and further out of the uh, labor market. Right? So you're starting to get a, a culture of public assistance. Uh, you're getting um, a community identification that says we're so poor, we're just pulling away, nobody wants us. You know, and when I worked in retail, and I had to do a lot of personnel training, the one thing I learned very quickly is if you have an individual wandering around going, I hate my job, I can't stand to be here, I don't want to do this, they're physically incapable of doing their job. When you have a community that's fallen so far out of the market that they don't see that there's even, you know, an end to the tunnel, they have the same problem. So you can say you're Comcast and you do a market survey. How many of you would adopt, you know, broadband if they brought it to you? Well, they can't afford $50 a month. They don't know what to do with it anyway, right? Because they, they haven't had it, they've heard about it. What are they going to say? No. So all of a sudden, you have the people who could bring part of the solution to place telling you, well, nobody wants it, so why should I bother? The worst plan is to get the brain drain. Anybody who is smart and they say, see, I, I can't do what I want to do, so I'm going to lose someplace else. And so right. the community lose out on talent. Exactly. And the, the people who have the talent who would like to stay home and build a community by bringing tax dollars in, unfortunately, don't have the connections necessary to do the online jobs that they want. But I don't want to you know, completely make this about broadband. Because what's also lacking is uh, we talk a lot about digital literacy as critical, but that's a cross the board problem. Almost none of our students coming to us from the high schools are digitally literate. There's another kind of literacy that's probably just as critical as financial literacy. Students coming to us from high school, students coming out of our colleges don't know how to run a business. So what part of my plan, part of my solution that I'm trying to build here is working with uh, the small business development centers, contract ed people for income of worker training. Uh, there's a lot of community ed programs out there that a lot of the county themselves have put together. Try to build a system where we can go in and say, all right, uh, it's important to go to school, but it's also important for the communities to be able to get back in 
to the market, which is increasingly digital and increasingly global. Think about it. You might have somebody up there who's a wood carver. You know, they live up, say, by why we fit. Where do they go to their market? Well, there's a there's a craft store in Chico. So they're going to drive all the way down from there in the spring time in the summer to a craft fair to sell their stuff. They're probably just going to break even, even if there's a huge demand for their stuff. On the other hand, if they could know how to use Craigslist, eBay, and all the other digital malls, all of a sudden, they could make a fairly decent business as long as the shipping costs don't be enough, which could be another problem. So there are a lot of entrepreneurial type opportunities in the north. And the thing about building those kinds of systems is that it brings enough money back into the communities to allow them to rebuild their school system. Uh, where do you do the STEM conference over in Sacramento? Uh, was it in November? No? Okay. Um, you were there? Okay. One of the keynote speakers was from India. He brought up what I think of as the New Delhi problem. What he found in his research was the further away these schools were from New Delhi, the worse the instructors were. Mm -hmm. Because the, the good instructors, of course, all wanted to go live in, you know, out of the, you know, the rural areas where we might have a build, literally, to uh, the big city where there's places to shop and pretty good kids and good schools and all that. Where did they make more money? So the next stage of the research was, okay, we'll go out there and, you know, give these teachers out in the far areas, you know, better skills. It's great. They learned the skills, they became great teachers, they moved closer to the new job. <laughs> <laughs> so he had to find a way to make those out air flying areas more attractive. And, you know, he's still working on it. But it's an interesting concept. And I think it kind of applies in our community colleges. I was going to say that one of the things that we probably do need to look at our model. Yeah. In other words, so what are they doing in developing this? We have a, uh, a program uh, here in the city in the southeast uh, uh, San Francisco, which is very low income, poor, most of the people don't have working families, the same kind of thing. And they have implemented a model that is actually implemented in African Indian mm -hmm. called Santa Schools. Yeah. They would teach them teach them, bring them to the center and they would teach them how to do things like WordPress, be a virtual assistant, you know, things that they could do from home. Right. Okay. And and start their start their own business. Teach them also, as you pointed out, what you have to do to be a sole proprietor. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't I think they don't have the financial literacy. They don't know how to set myself up as a sole proprietor so I can go out and, and, and sell and sell my services. But it's, it's, it's so they took this model. And it worked in, oh, yeah. worked in my Roby and, and in Delhi, and now it's working in Southeast. Yeah, yeah and then the, the first thing I thought of when I heard this gentleman speak was the movie to serve the love. Mm -hmm. um, the problem for a lot of our uh, schools that are in low income areas, whether it's rural California or, you know, somewhere down in LA or San Francisco is the fact that if that area is run down, nobody wants to live there. And that's are very, very dedicated to helping that particular population. Well, sad to say you don't really have a workforce development problem. You have an economic development. Yeah. 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 And uh, being the scope of the program we're currently doing, it just be like, well, let's get rid of Myron. Let's forget about the market. But uh, that would really be nice. <laughs> Well, you know, that's exactly. But uh, I'm willing to do whatever is going to fix it. It's like we're taking an economic development focus, which is, I think, the right uh, response to the situation. Yeah. This stuff used to come up back when broadband was first making a period. I worked at GTE at the time. 
and every community under the sun is showing up here. They're saying, we don't want to be uh, uh, bypassed by the broadband evolution. You know, city state was worried about this and everything else. Well, all this fear has ended, ended up not materializing because most of the metropolitan areas got broadband one way or another. But what I'm hearing now is there are some places that just have not happen. Yeah. And yeah. or satellite. You know, satellite works to a certain extent. The biggest problem with satellite is in kind of uh, a synchronous right. um, you know, situation where well, the word makes it quite a bit of difference in that this particular situation because like the fuse is doing is uh, much less latency than say a geosynchronous program use that. Right. But even there, um, we, we do have some companies like over in the Mendocino area that have been trying to survive off the of broadband and stop about an half of satellite and just a few seconds of lag. Yeah, they don't have how many seconds of lag anymore. I mean, you look at the work done in the Midwest in Ohio, mm -hmm. Indiana, Iowa, those those locations and what they've done with lower satellites in the education space. You guys you guys compare much with those things? Um, I haven't really. Um, my understanding is the satellites that we've been developing up here and for me the taking on here is the satellite has been the, the simple geosynchronous care. You know, there's a lot of low risk uh, satellite use. And the way I understand it a lot of times is you, your main point is the geosynchronous that hits the low earth and that uh, you know, becomes kind of a, a network of satellite. Right. And it's one directional distance. Yeah. Yes. So there, there can be lag depending on where you are as relative to the low satellite relative to the geosynchronous. You know, um, well, that's good to know. I'll have to do a little more research. Is there a volume issue though in terms of the, 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 even though you can get the speed, you can't get the volume? The volume is just going to be good. That's what you need. I mean, okay, well, I mean, if you have a classroom of students, you know, that wouldn't be a problem. And the real problem isn't so much, you know, uh, access at the, the schools themselves. So the schools do have broadband, and some of the libraries do. A lot of times it is the, the residents who live, say, on the side of the mountain, you know, where just getting a satellite to point at could be a real problem. And we're on the east side of the west side. How's the cellular? Cellular along the main routes, I-5, um, 101 is not as good. I-5 is pretty good. Uh, there's a federal mandate right now to get end-to-end -end satellite on all the major freeways or highways. I haven't had a very good definition of exactly what that, uh, what qualifies as a major highway. Well, so how, what's the availability of data plans? Like if you have an iPad, if you can the if you can get the data plan, or you have to it, That's actually pretty universal. I was, I was surprised by that, because I looked at that, thinking, well, because that story I told you last night, you know, but if you have access to that, it seems to me the educational opportunities, everything you can do for this is off of the line. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's kind of like, you know, bring out the can opener and your battery pack and drive that and let's get to work. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to have to do that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, this isn't going to be something you uh, a once and done solution. This is going to be an evolving solution. Yeah. This is a uh, Shasta area here. Yes. I, I heard a guy who was at Mission College about four years ago. He's mm -hmm. a computer networking type instructor. Where he was, he had the most great classroom where he's basically showing everybody how you can do all these things on the internet for free. Right. He didn't have any budget. So it was kind of like, these are all the things you can learn how to do with that website to the internet. And that's a really, you know, it's, it's almost like Firefox for computers, you know. Yeah. Or net zero. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, and there's, there's a lot of different things we're going to have to do. Like the, for the students who don't want to have to drive home from uh, McGarry, California, 20 miles away to Sterling City to have dinner, go back to McGarry to have internet access so they can do their homework, because their English teacher told them, I want you to do this research paper with the information you get online. And that happens. We're probably going to have to build a center, a, a search and rescue center in the city that has broadband that they're willing to let students come to and sit down and do their homework. We're going to have to build these hubs first 
using anything we can find. Cell phones, if that's what it takes. Um, you know, dark fiber, somebody's willing to pay to get a run up there. Um, there may be other technologies coming down the tube that we that I haven't heard about yet. I do know that about five years ago, AT&T, Comcast, everybody was running cables everywhere. And all of a sudden it just like stopped. Right? And I, I always kind of wondered, well, did they hear something I haven't heard about? Is there something coming down the tube that's going to make it cheaper to get broadband out here? And they don't want to invest anything until that comes? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, I keep looking. Hopefully I'll find out. But, you know. Uh, it, it is a key issue for us because, like they said, a lot of what we're developing for our colleges is increasing the amount of money. I've talked to a lot of people recently about, okay, Security Plus. Campuses hate people teaching Security Plus in their regular network classrooms. They're afraid that we're going to run something in there that's going to take down the entire campus. In some cases, their fears may be justified. So what's the solution? Well, you build this virtual network inside of a set of virtual servers, and everybody can log into that. That's great. And on campus, it can work really, really well. Plus, it saves them a lot of money because they don't have to go in and every semester we can figure a, a classroom that. You know, the computers in that lab just become smart terminals that the student can use to log into their homework. Well, once you start talking about that, everybody goes, oh yeah, and it would be great if they could access it from online at home so they could do their homework in these virtual environments, you know, asynchronously. That's great for most of California. But for about a quarter of our population, it's not really going to work. So we do have to try to work that out. Now, there are a lot of state and federal mandates and grants available to try to get uh, these kind of connections to our citizens. The, the problem seems to be that every time a new grant comes out, there's money there. The people who own the uh, the, not um, the people who you know charge the fees and the permits and the studies suddenly raise their prices. So now all of a sudden it costs more to put that cell tower in. By the way, it costs as much to put in the cell tower in fees and studies and things like that as it does to actually build it. But trenching it is even worse. Even if you have an existing trench and you go dig it up to run new cable, they're going to want you to do an EIR, environmental uh, report, impact report, which costs the company money. Which is why a lot of the companies now are running their cables through systems where they can just put it in one section here and pull it all the way through for several miles. Anything to save money. So it's an interesting dilemma. Right now, what I'd like to do is just go ahead and open this up to get your ideas on the challenges you see that we need to meet and the ideas you might have on how we can kind of uh, get around some of this stuff. You know, if you have ideas about, and among yourselves as well, not just, you know, raise your hand and ask your question. I'd like to kind of turn this into a discussion if we can. Because every one of you is probably from an area that has similar challenges. It may not be broadband, but it is in the far north. But it could be you know, economic status or you know, the amount of people in your classrooms who can actually afford to do these kinds of things. Yes, I, I think that, to me, the first question I ask myself in an area like that is what, what's the minimum technology you need to run a functional and growing business? Exactly. And then what's the answer to that question? And that's why I asked you about the cell phone data plan type coverage for iPads or something like that. Because that guy just was at work and as long as he can get close enough where his iPad is within a data plan, he can either hire someone to do a website or run his website or use eBay or whatever. He doesn't really need super broadband. He just needs to be able to get the orders. He needs a connection. Yes. And, and so 
a lot of times the full broadband experience is not spray, spoiled by it. I have it in my home, but I mean, uh, you don't need all that in mm -hmm. that business. No, but the, the thing of it is, as far as the ISPs are concerned, if you get people starting to use these systems and make money, they're going to want more. But now they'll have an income that will maybe allow them to buy more. So it gets back to what we teach in the partnership with the uh, entrepreneur. Right. That kind of stuff. That's a big fact. Uh, you know, in my case, in some areas, it may be the only fact. Um, we have, I mentioned Sterling City. It's a beautiful little town north of, where, actually, east of where I live, up in the foothills. And used to be a huge tourist attraction, used to have a huge lumber industry, which died in the 70s. And it went through a phase where it kind of became a, a druggy type of ghetto type thing. And now people are trying to revive it and bring it back. Well, one of the big things they would have would be hospitality. Unfortunately, the restaurants have all closed down, decayed. Uh, the museum is kind of a shack, you know. The hotel that was once there that used to be a real destination is falling apart, you know. So they need to have some kind of financial growth opportunity that they can invest in, make money from, so that they can invest in the next stage to kind of bring them the city back to life. And unfortunately, that's a real common story where I live. You know, a lot of beautiful country. The last thing anybody up there wants to do is bring in something like a destructive industry, coal mining or something like that. You know, probably next to entrepreneurial, hospitality would be one of the biggest draws. But nobody wants to go someplace where they don't have Wi-Fi, right? Um, most people don't want to go someplace where they might have a nice hotel and restaurant, but the rest of the city is trashed. I actually told the people, um, there's a historical society up there that's trying to renovate the city. And I said, you know, what you guys are trying to do is great. I'm doing anything I can to help you. But the first thing you've got to do is you've got to get the community together and convince them that they have to be part of the solution. They have to clean up their front yard. They have to, you know, make the place look welcoming, like some place that people would want to go. A classic example, my wife, if I take her to a restaurant, if the outside of that building run, looks run down, she will not go in, right? Because she thinks it's a dive, it's going to be unhealthy and all these other things. Maybe the best food in the world, and oftentimes is, but she's not even going to go try it. Same thing with a lot of the cities up in far north that are basically falling apart. The sad thing about that, you, you don't have the income coming into the cities. There's no tax base anymore. The schools suffer. You know, they live off of what little bit they can get from the, the state. Now, our deputy sector navigator program is great. Um, most of us have about $500,000 to work with. The truth is, that's, as Steve has called it before, budget dust for a lot of organizations. Um, the sad truth is that for a lot of our colleges, and this may be true statewide, not just in rural California, that's probably more discretionary money than they've ever had in the past tech decade. So this, this is, you know, it's a great thing we're doing. It's not enough, but if we can get it invested in ways that generate, you know, that wheel turning to where we start moving along again and start, you know, making California a place to do business, we might might actually do some good. Yeah, it is. And I'm not going to ask you questions about budget issues. Go ahead. I don't have to do it. But we have recently found that the local workforce investment for the local right. development agencies are very anxious to do And yet they're the best kept secret in California. And, I, and I'm wondering, I, you know, usually they seem kind of uh, based on the county, uh, mm -hmm. city. Is there a, in your counties, are there? There are. Uh, and one of my challenges here 
is getting the, the counties and the cities and the schools in touch with those workforce investment reports, which means I have to get them to sit down and say, okay, what do I really need? What can I propose to them that they'll be willing to fund? Because it has to be very specific. And that's why I asked about that one of my business. Right. Because the work that the, one of the things the district did was start from the very beginning is really taking a look at the environment, the supply and the demand, right. and continually update that with the information that they get. And if that is what gets their attention. Yeah. I mean, it was based on our research. The San Francisco Office of Economic Development was the government went out and got a $70 million grant to begin to get more students on this right. pathway. And I think maybe it's a smaller scale or maybe it has a wider, unfortunately, scope <laughs> that you have to deal with. Yeah. But I still think it might be a, right. it might be a And you touched on something I should have mentioned. You know, most of the colleges around here may be an hour apart, but not because of distance, because of traffic. Yeah. You know, uh, my colleges are about an hour and a half to three hours apart from each other because of distance. Some of the most beautiful country you ever want to drive through, you know, from, you're not going to get from Chico to Redwoods and back in a day. You know, I think there's a study you can consider doing, mm -hmm. or maybe it's already been done, where there's a, a correlation drawn between the labor market uh, information for ICT jobs in, in an area that has broadband versus one that doesn't. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and if you can demonstrate that there's you know, all the growth that broadband brings, and I think people have been talking about this. Yeah, I've heard a lot of anecdotal information, but I really haven't seen solid evidence on a local level. I've, I've seen a few studies nationwide. I, I'm thinking that your role may be become an advocate with your elected officials and your legislative staff mm -hmm. and other... Uh, the work working. Yeah, I see myself as being, you know, a, a resource magnet try to bring these people together. Uh, one of the problems as far as broadband for rural California goes is the fact that you have a lot of alliances out there trying to make this happen. They're not necessarily talking to each other. So they don't have a single political voice. I don't see you as a resource man. I see you as a knight in shining armor. <laughs> Your check's in the mail. <laughs> a, a, a big horse. It's just brilliant. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Yeah, and, and what uh, characterizes your community and employees right. versus other uh, segments of the industry? So, for example, if you have a very loyal employee base, you want to live there, mm -hmm. most uh, high employment, you probably have high uh, reliability as far as the employees would go. Right. So, things like this is cost outsourcing that are. Uh, Suffer for turnover in a huge way. Right. Uh, they don't look for markets that have uh, a lower cost, right. but higher lawyers. Yeah, and that's, that's excellent. Uh, we have those people that are there because they want to be there. We also have a lot of people that got trapped there by the housing market. You know, uh, they're invested in their homes, maybe it's paid off, but the value of their home is so low now compared. To what they could sell it for, you know, and go try to live somewhere else. You know, it, it's just it's not an equation that works for them at their labor skill. You know, it doesn't make sense for a logger to try to move to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. We all have that. Yeah. You know, and uh, these are great ideas. I like this because it really I do need to uh, expand my focus and find ways to get some uh, solutions that are actually going to make things happen. Right. 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 Surprisingly, after the piece about two fifty to three, even though I I I thought it was too much, they subscribed to me. Right. And I feel like if we get critical in that, if we get them excited, I think that's when we're going to get into the field of writers who want to go in and get the people yeah. that can subscribe. They're not going to subscribe for the words. Right. It's it's kind of a catch twenty two. 
then I, I mentioned that a little bit when I said, you know, the people like Comcast go in there, do a, a market survey to see who's going to subscribe, and they're being told nobody, <laughs> you know, because we have to go in and get these communities invested in their own survival. Yeah. You have to go to them. They would come to the training to be called. Right. Be a bus or anything, a little, a little Mexican store. Yeah. Yeah. But once they learn, they will Yeah, I like that idea because when I first started looking at this, I naively thought, well, we could get the small business development centers to put their mentors online through video conferencing, and these people could all sign in and get it, <laughs> get their training. Uh, not quite. <laughs> are there libraries? There are libraries. Not all of them have uh, internet connections, um, although that's, that's changing. The problem with the libraries right now, and a lot of the schools as well, is their operating hours are very limited. There are some libraries that are open literally one day a week. Yeah. We work with posts in those areas, post as police officers training and do all their training at kind of West, we still have to send them to the Yeah. So even the even the police and utilities don't have that access. And fire departments so don't either. So we mail them all their training materials. Mm -hmm. Because they have dialogue. You know, we literally have fifty sixteen other in our in our firehouse. <laughs> So we'll, we'll, we'll probably have to do some kind of hybrid. It's mostly north of here. Yeah. Involved. Everything south is all online. We do everything online. North of San Francisco is where we start having the analogy. Yeah, and I know CDF is working real hard to get some kind of connection to all their stations. Yeah. <laughs> Just one more minute. One more minute. Okay. Sorry. Do you use a community broadcasting network in the same company without training? Probably. Um, I imagine a lot of those people probably do have uh, satellite, satellite antenna TV. Almost everybody figures out a way to get TV or they move together. Yeah. Uh, so if you could get a cable program where you put together some uh, basic training and you, and you can go out for proper tests or something like that, you might move that thing. Yeah, that would be good. Because we definitely need to get these people employed. Uh, 1.6 million people uh, who are basically falling out of the job market because they don't have a connection, you know, that's just not sustainable for California. And another thing, too, is the kids who are actually economic development agencies, Microsoft has Okay. That's good to know. And I know the libraries, a lot of them use Job Scout. Well, I want to thank you for, for being here and putting up with me and, you know, giving me feedback, which was what I would came here for. I guess we're out of time. <laughs> we're going to expect your report next year. Uh, I have that much time? <laughs> wow. What year are you On how you solve the problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I will gladly, I will gladly put together a whole TV program for you if I solve this solution in a year. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. I, I will be very interested.